anti afro Spengalis. I am on here to give my review of a Derek Chauvin trial. You know, the former police officer on trial for the murder slash manslaughter of George Floyd. Now this week, I'm seeing the prosecution's case coming together. Last week I was concerned. I was concerned about this forcing the emotions on everybody when the case is already emotional. You just needed to put the case on. The case is shaping up this week, but I have to let you all know, I still have concerns. When I say concerns, I'm focusing on strategy. I'm not thinking about verdict at this point. I am focusing on strategy and I am wondering why is it that the brother prosecutor is not the lead prosecutor? What is the reason that there are four prosecutors on this case? It's very distracting. When I say distracting, I'm thinking about the jury. When you have four people popping up on this case, what is the reason that the brother is not the lead prosecutor? And I am going to answer the question. I have the same concern that I had that I talked about last week. I feel he's used as a prop. He's being used to address the incendiary aspects of the case. When the medical examiner information comes up, here he comes presenting. What is the reason that he can't be the lead? It's reasonable to have two prosecutors on a case. But four, let me tell you, strikes as nervousness, strikes as panic, strikes as lack of confidence. And that actually did bear out in many respects this week, although I don't think it's necessary. You don't need to push the panic button because they have some very good evidence that they put on. I don't think that they're confident though. That is something that is a concern. And I think the jury may very well pick that up. If I'm picking it up, is it possible the jury might pick it up? When I say jury, that means anyone in the jury can pick it up, not the whole entire jury. Obviously, they're individual people. So when you say jury, it means anyone. Just keep that in mind. Now, at the beginning of the week, when it became known they're going to be talking about policy and police operations, that's good information to put on because we can't assume that the jury knows this information. We don't ever want to assume that. The only concern was the information was entirely too much. The base information, great idea. It didn't need to be an entire semester worth of information jammed into an entire day. Great information. Just give the basics. Do they really expect the jury to absorb even one third of all of that information about crisis response, about all the things the police officers are supposed to be doing in terms of the arrest procedures? Give us some general basic information. Hours and hours and hours the jury is not going to retain that information, people. Guaranteed. Not going to retain it. Now, the other thing I thought was completely unnecessary. And I'll tell you why. Because you had someone coming on who did an excellent job. And it would have been leaving it at that. You had a sergeant from the Los Angeles Police Department. The training sergeant did a great job giving information about use of force, proper procedures. 
excellent job. What was the reason that the police chief had to be put on the witness stand? I thought it was completely unnecessary. And I'll tell you why. It gave the defense an opportunity. It was totally unnecessary to embarrass the prosecutor by asking, when was the last time you made an arrest? That one question, it was ridiculous, people. It was no point to putting the police chief on the witness stand. What did he add to the case? He didn't add anything. It was a waste. The sergeant did a great job. That had been, that's a highlight. Although the defense, you know, asked, you know, the que questions, okay, he did a great job. Let's put the people on who are pounding the pavement, have the most recent experience, have the training experience. See, the police chief didn't have that type of experience. The police chief got in the business to go up the administrative ladder not the training ladder, the administrative ladder. That is very different from somebody who pounded the pavement day to day. He was in the gang detail. He has most experience actually arresting people, use of force. That's your witness right there. You didn't need the police chief to come on and tell you anything. I don't know what the heck he was trying to prove by putting the police chief on the witness stand. People, please. I think, again, the prosecution is nervous. I think you can have a lot of lawyers on a case, but they don't need to be in the courtroom. That gives an impression that you're worried, that you're concerned, that you don't think you have a case that can be won. And so when you give that impression to the jury, that is not a good look. It's just not. Be confident in the case that you have on. So let me tell you what else I thought was interesting. You have the medical testimony, which I thought was riveting. You have the pulmonologist, you have an emergency room doctor, although the experts that they put on, I thought it was a good idea. Although the emergency room physician they put on to counter, I guess you can say counter their own witnesses. I thought that was a great strategy because it gave an opportunity to draw out other alternatives and explain because the defense attorney at the beginning, at the opening statement made it very clear that the prosecution wasn't happy with the results of the autopsy and the statements that the professionals, the medical professionals, the experts that you can't get around calling. You're gonna have to call the emergency room physician. You're gonna have to call the medical examiner. So what did the prosecution have to do? They had to go out and get experts to counter their own witnesses because these witnesses have to be called. That's a very unusual move, but I think they did a great job of identifying some witnesses who did very well on direct examination. Well, at least most of them did. But one witness flubbed it up pretty bad for the prosecution. And that was Dr. Thomas, the woman. The other medical experts, held their ground, although the defense came at them professionally. I think it was pretty much kind of a toss up, but I think Dr. Thomas did damage to the prosecution. The, the woman, the um, pathologist, the forensic pathologist, the expert witness, she did a great job on direct examination. Not only did she do damage to herself, she rattled the prosecutor and you could tell when he came up on redirect, his, he lost his composure. Okay. Let me go back. 
when the prosecutor did his direct, she was great. She answered the questions. She was pretty much, I'll say devastating. She was able to draw her conclusions and she's allowed to do that. She's an expert witness. She struck home runs where they needed to be struck. She laid blame to the police for the demise of George Floyd, about him being on that ground. She was very clear that they were responsible, contributed significantly to his death. She laid the responsibility on the police. Okay, if you are sure in your position, Dr. Thomas, stick to your position and don't let the defense attorney rattle you. But what happens when the defense attorney gets up and the defense attorney is not a bully. The defense attorney is pretty even kill. An even kill defense attorney gets up and she loses her composure to the point where the judge has to, <laughs> I'm sorry. If the judge has to admonish an expert witness, you know, it's not a good scene. Okay. It is not a good scene. If you go check out the testimony, people check out the testimony of Dr. Thomas, the female forensic pathologist, the expert witness. She lost her composure on the witness stand. She became silent. She was tongue tied. She was panting. She kept asking him to repeat questions. And I'm going, what do we have here? She was sarcastic. Her credibility was essentially, I don't want to say destroyed because I don't think that's fair, but it was severely compromised. And I just think, I don't know why she felt she couldn't just answer the question and defend her position, maintain your position, because I think her position was a pretty strong position that she was guided by the prosecutor, stand your ground. But even worse than that, when the prosecutor got up, he was blazing. He was very angry. <laughs> Brother was angry and I'm going, what is going on here? The jury's sitting right there, people. And so the judge had to, I want to say admonish, the judge sustained a couple of the defense's objections because they were argumentative. So he's losing his composure. When the defense attorney objects to a question that he tries to ask, I mean, the way he formulated the beginning of the question, you can already tell the question wasn't going to be allowed. So of course the judge sustains the objection and the prosecutor comes back at the judge and the way he does it, it's not proper. I mean, he's not going to be held in contempt, but it's not the way you would respond to the judge and the judge maintains his position and the prosecutor gives the judge stink eye, AKA dirty look and gets all huffy and we're in a trial and this is in the presence of a jury. The jury's not going to notice that the defense attorney has pulled you off your square. Strategy people, people underestimate this type of scenario. It is very important to maintain your cool. Confidence in your case goes a long way to convincing a jury about what you're putting forth. You're trying to convince people that your case deserves to be the one that prevails. It was not a good look. You had the witness answering the questions like they should have been answered. And now you both have lost your composure. <laughs> oh my God, people. This defense attorney is keeping his cool 
And I think my feeling, he's encroaching upon the prosecution's case with this strategy. I think it's fascinating that you can encroach upon a prosecutor's case in the manner that he did. I don't know if the witness wasn't prepared, but, and he's not mean, he's not nasty. He's obviously extremely skilled and he is by himself handling all of the witnesses against four prosecutors. Do you get what I'm saying, people? I'm certainly not out to romanticize this situation in any way, shape or form. The lead defense attorney, Nelson, behind him, there is another attorney and you best believe people, there is a cavalry of other defense attorneys sitting somewhere in a war room full of computers and phones and big screen TVs tuning in to every second of this trial, researching every word that is said. We just can't see them. This is going to be very interesting. The medical testimony, again, I think the prosecution had very good experts to counter. Now, let me also explain the medical examiner. He gave some very devastating statements after George Floyd died and he had to own up to those statements and it was very difficult. He stated, because I know everybody's upset about people focusing on the drugs, but the medical examiner said it. He said that George Floyd had a fatal dose of fentanyl. He said that. Do you think a defense attorney is going to let that go? We called him on it. Where are you going to move with that? So the medical examiner did the professional thing, which I think is what he should do. He kept his cool and admitted he perhaps spoke too soon and didn't give all of the information because when you say a fatal dose, that's going to be relative to a lot of other information like tolerance level, a person's weight, all these different factors. But the dose itself, this is true, it was a fatal dose, just saying that. But instead of getting discombobulated, the medical examiner just remained calm and explained that. So he had good recovery. However, there was another concern because after the results of the autopsy were released, there was a Zoom meeting. This defense attorney had access to the Zoom meetings. I mean, they had access to every single conversation that went on and something quite inappropriate was going on. It was the medical examiner having a discussion with the prosecution and Again, going back to the opening statement where the defense attorney said the prosecution was not happy with the medical examiner's autopsy report. So here they are engaging the medical examiner in a discussion about, well, had it not been for the police doing dot, 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 isn't it true, dot, 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 with George Floyd, wouldn't have this occurred? and engaging the medical examiner in a discussion about if this had not occurred, wouldn't this had been the result if this would have occurred? And that's not really appropriate because when the medical examiner writes a report, he writes a report. You can't engage in a discussion about supposition because it's not relevant. These are the results. So the medical examiner did state that he wrote a letter to the district attorney's office after that meeting. So he did cover himself and made it very clear. The autopsy report is the autopsy report. 
So I don't know whether or not that was like a nudge, nudge, wink, wink effort to try to get him to change the report. Didn't happen, but he stood his ground. He was very professional. He wasn't rattled. He covered all bases and made it very clear. He sent a letter to the district attorney's office, making it very clear this was his report. And that discussion actually had no relevance to anything other than it was a discussion and that was it. But you can believe the defense attorney is going to seize upon that later on in the trial. At this state of the game, I'm focused on strategy. You got to shut down the emotion. You got to focus on strategy and you got to decide what you need to do to prevail. And that's the mindset of this defense attorney. But unfortunately, the prosecutor is getting a little triggered. The brother got to get it together, brother, if you want to win this case, because the jury is watching. The prosecution has a good case. They just need to reel it in and not get triggered. Of course, you all know I have a lot more I need to say about a lot more things. In the meantime, you know the drill. Fire. Be where?